Hi everyone, welcome to our Design Bites. Um, today our guest is Matt Johnson. He's an industrial designer and educator. Um, and we also have on our panel myself, Megan Carey, president of AIGA Mobile, and Paige Garland, um, our content director at AIGA Mobile. Um, so we are gonna get started today by asking some questions. Um, feel free to add your own questions, um, either in the chat pod or in the Q&A. Uh, section of the Zoom webinar panel. Uh, we'll answer those closer to the end of the webinar. Um, and introduce yourselves. We'd love to know who you are and where you're from. So we're going to get started. Matt, could you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your career so far? Uh, okay, so as you said, my name is Matt Johnson. I am a industrial designer by, by training, but I've sort of done all sorts of things. I started off uh, in, with an arts training, a fine arts training. I have a bachelor of fine arts degree uh, from Florida State University uh, in both painting and sculpture. And while I was there, although I enjoyed doing art, I sort of did it my whole life. I was like, you know, I think I want to apply this art to something, you know. And I had heard about industrial design. So then uh, after I graduated, I went to, moved to Brooklyn and went to Pratt Institute where I got a uh, master of industrial design there and then just started working in the New York uh, City area for a long time actually I lived I lived up there I grew up in Florida but I lived up there for about 17 years uh, until I moved down here uh, about five years ago uh, to the Alabama um, so I married my wife Annie is an interior designer and right now we have a business uh, an interior design business together and that's that's our full-time job I still have some part-time jobs that I do designing stuff but uh, that's what we do now um, there is a there's a guy a podcaster his name is Reed Hoffman he is the founder of LinkedIn uh, and he actually um, started uh, PayPal and he's a big big deal in in um, Silicon Valley but he has this podcast called called uh, Masters of Scale and one of the things that he says about himself and all the jobs that he's had is that he has done like tours of duty. And I really like the way he frames this as far as those jobs, because he's done a lot of different jobs. And that's sort of been the way my career has, has gone through. And I'll tell you, let me tell you some of the tours of duty that I've gone through. So uh, I worked as an automotive sculptor uh, at General Motors for a short time. I've been a freelance product designer uh, I've done uh, fashion housewares design. I work for um, uh, a fashion designer named Cynthia Rowley. She's a pretty big fashion designer in New York. And she had a line of housewares that she was designing for, for Target. So I worked with her to do a bunch of things. I'll show you some pictures of that later. Uh, I've worked for pharmaceutical promotional products. Uh, I was a uh, professor and coordinator for the industrial design program at Kane University in Union, New Jersey for about nine years doing that um so teaching i've worked for cosmetics uh displays companies so all that stuff that's uh like in cvs or whatever all those displays for cosmetics i worked for a company and we, we designed and built those um i've done pop displays for like walmart and those kinds of things and then i moved down here and started doing product development for a promotional products company um bringing in all sorts of products and designing lots of drinkware and things like that and then now I'm working in interior design. So lots of tours of duty. I seem to, to bounce around to all sorts of things. But that's, that's kind of, in a nutshell, my, my career. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, so in your own words, what would you say is human-centered design? And how does that relate to your work? So human-centered design, it's funny. If you look into it, it's, there's, there's a whole academic, philosophical thing behind human-centered design. And you can get really technical and there's all sorts of methodologies and stuff that go behind it. But um, in a very simple way, human-centered design, the way that I like to see it, is just keeping your client or whoever you're designing for front of mind. So we, we tend sometimes when we design stuff to, to go through and think about stuff that we like or other sort of parameters and Sometimes the, the end user or the client gets forgotten or, or caught up in the whole jumble. Human centered design is making sure that that person, whoever we're designing for, is in front of mind and we're always thinking about them. It's sort of a, 
it's a it's about priorities making sure that they are a priority throughout the whole process sort of the opposite of human centered design would be designing for yourself and somebody who designs or creates things for themselves we call them an artist right so they're expressing their their own ideas or if you're beholden to some sort of material or technology maybe you work for a, a paper company that makes a very special kind of paper and, and your job is to design things that uses that paper well in that case you're kind of a salesman you're just trying to get that paper to continue to sell um, but human centered design is keeping people and your client uh, in front of you so that you can um, always be making sure that your final design works for whoever it is that you're designing for um, something interesting that we talked about that if if we look at the the title of this is that three brains and this sort of brings us into that three brains concept which is the idea of brain number one is the brain that has needs and desires and that's the client right and brain number two is the is the brain that has ideas and insights and that's the designer that's all that's all of us the designer and then brain number three is the is the brain that has the means of the production uh, or to make, to execute whatever it is you're designing and that would be the printer or the factory or you know whatever something like that and so the designer is sort of the one that's in between brain number two is in between brain number three and brain number one to make sure that we're mediating between the two because if you sort of go into their into their heads you have brain number one we have doggies um we have brain number one is saying this is what i want this is the client this is what i want and this is what i'm going to pay right and then brain number three is saying this is what i got and this is how much it's going to cost you and then brain number two which is the designer is in between those two saying hey 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 guys can't we just can we just get along you know can't we find something in between here and that's again that human centered design we have humans on two sides of us we have the client we have the person the factory or the printer whomever it is um and we have to appeal we have to figure out a way to make something that works in in the real world and fulfills the desires and the needs of the client that sounds really similar to what we face as most of us being graphic designers every day anyway. I think maybe human centered design isn't a term that we use a lot or we call it UX or UI. Um, and I think it's nice to see that across different design disciplines, we all deal with the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really curious to see some of your work. Could you show us some of that? Sure. Let me do the old screen share here. All right, <clears throat> so I'll just walk you through some some stuff that uh, I've worked on over the years. So, my first job out of school in New York, actually was in it was across the across the river in New Jersey, was for Daewoo Electronics, and we were designing all sorts of uh, uh, TV uh, TVs and vacuums and things like that. This is a, a 13 inch TV. This is actually a Photoshop rendering. So this is what we would do. Uh, it's all of our concepts. We would render them up from drawings in Photoshop and uh, they had all this factory capacity for these 13 inch CRTs back. This is like back in 2000, I think about 2000, 2001. And although everybody was buying flat panels, they wanted to sell these. So we were trying to find cool ways to make a, a 13 inch TV look interesting. So these are some renderings for some concepts for that. This is a microwave that I designed for, uh, again, a rendering or microwave for, for Daewoo. Um, and this was fun because I had to learn on the job how to do these, how to do these, these photorealistic uh, Photoshop renderings just out of nothing. And it was kind of a fun skill to learn. I had a, I had a really good boss at that time. Um, and of course, industrial designers, we have to be able to draw and sketch all the time. So this was like a video game that I worked on when I was a freelancer. Uh, and these are just some sketches. And this is the way, this sort of that visual um, uh, language that industrial designers have to be able to do. We have to communicate what's in our head down on the page for other people to be able to understand uh, what it is we're proposing to do. And this is, you know, part of that sort of quick sketching thing. Um, this again was another concept that I worked for this, this dentist guy who was working on remote dentistry. He wanted to be able to do uh, like through the internet, if you had like a third world country that didn't have good dentists, um, you could hook this machine into the patient's uh, mouth and then a dentist somewhere else in the world that's a really good one could actually 
uh, uh, work it remotely and stuff. It was it was quite the interesting job doing this. But I got to do these really fun drawings and concepts for this these sort of uh, horrific looking dental devices that uh, that people might be out of a movie or something like that. Um, okay, so this is a uh, swell that I was talking about. So you see in the bottom corner here, you see a picture of Cynthia Rowley and her her business partner Eileen Rosenzweig. Um, Eileen was the fashion editor for the New York Times and Cynthia is the, uh, the designer. And so this was some of that stuff that I was designing and the whole theme for this swell uh, campaign that they were doing this line of products was that kind of swanky 60s throw how to throw a party kind of stuff. So everything had this uh, grow grain stripe. This was a, um, a, a, a fun uh, picture frame, but the idea was that you had a little picture on the back on the, so, when, you're at, when you have it like on your desk at work, the main picture's facing you, but you have a little picture that faces whoever's sitting across from you to sort of give them a little something. Um, but these are some of the other things that we were designed. It was all housewares, things. So this is a line of assets, uh, you know, sold in Target. And the way that we would work these up was uh, we would illustrate them. Uh, we didn't do any CAD work on this because Target wanted to send it all to their, to their factory stuff. So we would go through and do these illustrations for all these kind of fun concepts and stuff and send them off and and uh, then they would price them out and everything like that. So these were just uh, Photoshop and Illustrator uh, drawings that we would do back then. Uh, I worked for a company that did uh, pharmaceutical products for our promotional ph ph pharmaceutical products and all of these were meant to help uh, promote the, the various drug brands and stuff like that, but they all had to have a medical purpose to them. So the one up in the corner is, is called the time light. And this was meant for like a psychologist. It was a way to let the psychologist know that their time was up at, during a session. The lights would sort of come on almost like a stoplight without interrupting or bothering the patient or something like that. Um, the big one that you see with the x-rays, it, it was a portable x-ray viewer that you could walk around with instead of having to put it on the wall if you needed to show um, a, 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 a a patient or something like that. Um, this was, actually this is very prescient right now. This was a whole antibacterial spray and um, a campaign for keeping your hands clean that we were working on uh, for a drug company. And uh, of course now, you know, it's hard to even buy antibacterial uh, wipes and stuff like that. But this, these are all dispensers and things that were designed to be able to pump this stuff out. Um, now we move on to when I was at the university. Um, I got to do a lot of work with my students. So we would do uh, design work together. So we did this whole project, this research project on design for dwarfism, uh, people who have dwarfism. And we came up, one of the things we came up with was, was this ladder, which is called the drop step ladder. And the idea was that it's a ladder that can be used with uh, regular sized people, average sized people, and, and people who have dwarfism. And you can take this ladder and flip it over like this, and when it's in the number one position, you see it has regular rung spacing, which is difficult for someone with really short legs, but when you flip the ladder over, it automatically doubles the rung spacing, the, the rungs fall down, and you can see the picture of the, the woman um, in the corner there, and she could more easily be able to walk up and use this ladder because um, the rung spacing is, is tighter. So that was fun, we, we got that published in a, in, a, in a book and a whole bunch of other things for this, which is cool. Um, again, this was at the university. This is something called the talk chart that actually some graphic design students originally came up with. And it was a way to communicate with patients in the hospital who either can't speak for some reason or they don't speak the language and uh, they can communicate whether they're uncomfortable or whether they need something. They can point to parts on their body that hurt and there's a pain chart, all sorts of stuff. And I worked with them on this, and we converted this into a portable version. Originally, it was just a printout, but we made this portable version that you could fold up and take with you. And actually, you can see down in the corner, we entered it into this national um, uh, competition, ended up winning uh, an award for it, for this uh, talk chart pop-out thing, which is kind of fun to do. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, I worked for a company that made cosmetics uh, displays. So here is uh, a Revlon display to show uh, various ways that you can uh, use some of their implements, their beauty. And this, these are sketches, this one is. Uh, but then here's some real stuff here. And you know, um, 
all the inline stuff has to fit in the system to, to fit on the wall. So there was a lot of engineering that we had to do. And then we had to fit all of these displays with all these special graphics and it had to fit the product and it had to clip into the wall. And there was so many parameters. Um, but this is basically the kind of stuff that I would do. Uh, the big one, the tall one was kind of fun. It's actually a migration tool but on the bottom. The thing spins to let you know what the old eyeshadow color was and then the new eyeshadow color was. And uh, we had to engineer this whole thing. So it's kind of fun. Um, this is also the cosmetics, but this is what's called prestige. And this is the kind of stuff that you're going to find in, in stores like Macy's or, uh, or Lord and Taylor or whatever. And so you'll see the SE display there for the really, they're that sort of high end nail polish um, that I designed. And then this one's for Bobby Brown. Uh, this was a Christmas uh, display that where you would buy like a whole packet of stuff and they wanted to, sh to show all this. So we, I had to design, you know, how to put all this together. Um, and then we would do stuff like this for L'Oreal um, and the Estee Lauder and, you know, it was a whole big business. And then when I moved down here to the Mobile area, I worked for uh, Crown Products that later became Imagine Brands. And this is regular promotional products. And I was in charge of bringing all their stuff into their catalog, but also I would design things, mostly drinkware. And so all of this is various pieces of drinkware and stuff that I would design for, for Crown to, to sell. And then lastly, you see ALJ Interiors is our interior design firm that we, uh, that my wife and I run. My wife is the certified interior designer. I kind of help her with stuff. She's really the star of the show. Um, but uh, this is a, a nursery that uh, we worked on recently. And I'm showing this now because that little bookcase is actually a reading nook for the, the child to be able to get in. And they wanted this under the sea version. And so I actually designed and fabricated this bookshelf reading nook to look like a, like a submarine or something like that. And, and then I painted this mural on the wall of all this undersea life and stuff, which was kind of fun. So the client was very happy. But here's some of the other stuff that we do. So this is like a, a, a nice luxury bathroom uh, with a shower and everything that we did recently. Um, Here's a before and after. You can see on the left what the kitchen used to look like, and on the right what we were able to do to it to, to bring it up and make it much nicer. Here's another one. This was an old barn um, or a shed outside of a house, and they wanted to turn it into like a second uh, residence. And here's you know what we do with that same space. So again, my wife does most of this. I, I sort of help her uh, with this, but she is the certified interior designer. But this is our main job now. Uh, that we do and um, it's quite it's quite good here in the in the Baldwin County area because you have a lot of people that that move here and need to renovate stuff so that's really neat do you ever run into any of these uh, products that you've worked on in the store um occasionally yeah uh, I'll go in the store and see like the the, the, the Ramane bottles here um like the 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 Ramonade, but the blue one with the, the little squid on it that you see there, that one is for sale for uh, in a retail environment now, and some of these other ones are. And so I run into them every now and then, especially when I worked on the on the cosmetics. Uh, I used to drive my wife nuts because when I worked in the cosmetics industry, my office was filled with makeup. I just had makeup, makeup, makeup all over the place, um, and. Whenever we'd go into a store, I would go and look at the makeup aisle to check to see whatever our newest thing was to see if it was installed right or if it was working or something like that. And she, she'd always complain that her husband was constantly going to the makeup aisle. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Alas, that's the thing. So, okay. yeah, Matt, what would you say is your biggest challenge when you're designing a product? Um... Let's see, biggest challenge. It's usually the constraints that happen. You know, um, I usually don't have a problem with being creative or coming up with stuff, but um, it depends on whatever the, um, the constraints are. Sometimes the constraints are really, uh, people have a lot of very specific things that they, that they have to sort of fit into, and sometimes it's wide open. And uh, it can be difficult in both ways. When it's wide open, sometimes you just have this big blank canvas and it's like, oh, I could, I could go anywhere, so where should I go, you know? Uh, and then sometimes it's so narrow, it's like, we want a Rolls Royce for a penny, and can you do it? 
in a week, you know, and, and that's usually the thing is working with the constraints um, and, and the fact that they're always changing depending on whoever the client is. So that's pretty much it. Uh oh, somebody's muted. Sorry, the dog was oh, barking yeah. again. Um, so could you share with us a little bit more about your process and the methods that you follow? Um, I'm curious to see how close they are to maybe the processes that we follow as well. Um, so before I get into it, I have a four part process that I used to teach to my students and that I they go through. There's all sorts of very specific things that you can do that everybody tries to, to walk through, but I, I've broken it down to four basic um, uh, uh, ideas. But before I, before I even say those, I always tell my students, uh, and even for myself when I'm doing design, is that you want to be prepared ahead of time to do the design. So I'm a, I'm a product designer, and when I'm going out looking for jobs or clients, what, what I'm not looking for is a client to compose a piece of music, right? Um, I could probably compose a piece of music and maybe even do a good job, but I wouldn't be able to do it in any sort of expedient amount of time. I would have to prepare and, and build up my skills to do that, um, and it would take a while um, to do that. But so I look, I look for jobs that are design and product related usually because I'm ready to do that. I have pre-prepared. And so the things that I, I used to tell my students about, about this is, first of all, reading and studying broadly. So constantly be reading articles and news and books and visiting museums and stores and all sorts of things so that you have this inflow of information into your brain so that when someone says, hey, I need this design, you have this library that you can immediately pull from. And you don't always have to go out and do a whole bunch of research. I mean, you always do have to do some research. But by having stuff in your brain ready to go, current events, uh, current trends that are happening, uh, you can make decisions much more efficiently. Uh, number two is capturing in inspiration. That's, that's like my big thing that I always tell everybody is, to capture your inspiration. Whenever you see a comedian go up and do a stand-up bit, everybody always thinks that the comedian just sort of sits down at their table and writes out the stand-up bit, right? But that's never the way it happens. Comedians walk around with a little pad of paper or a note thing on their phone, and whenever something funny occurs to them throughout the day, they write it down. And then they have this list of all these things, and then they stitch them together into a, a, a stand-up bit or, or a, a script or something like that. The same thing is true with design, is that you need to be constantly capturing your inspiration. Uh, we try to hold these ideas that we have in the front of our brains, and it's really difficult to do that or to move on to a new concept if we're constantly trying to hold these. But by taking our inspiration, our ideas for anything, any kind of creative idea, and putting it down in a, in a sketchbook or a notepad or something, frees our mind up to be able to move on to the next thing. And then we know we've sort of locked it in and it's there and we can go back to it and use it. So I always tell people that. And then lastly, it's removing obstacles. Um, this is about that preparing. So by removing obstacles is if you want to do work in Photoshop, like if you're interested in that and your Photoshop skills are rusty, um, then you need to bone up and get those skills going so that again, when someone hires you, you're ready to go and you don't have to have this sort of prepare, uh, uh, you know, uh, boot camp for yourself to, to get ready to do it. So that, that's a big thing is to, to prepare ahead of time. Now, as far as the four steps of design that I always tell people, um, first one is identify the problem. And you can call that problem a need or an opportunity if you want, but you need to identify something that needs to be done. Um, and the best ones are the ones that have pathos, which means there's an emotional attachment to it where there is um, some pain point that's happening. Those are the best problems to solve because people are anxious to remove whatever that pain point is or that emotional issue. Um, if people are like, meh, about whatever it is that you want to design, then maybe it doesn't need to be designed right now, you know, you know, because people are kind of like, whatever about it. Um, so that's number one, identify the problem. Number two, as I always tell people, uh, or I do myself, um, ideate the possible solution. So once you've identified that problem, and that could be a lot of research to figure out what the problem is. Sometimes people have an issue, but they don't know what the problem is. And 
sometimes you have to do a lot of research to figure that out, to, to tease that out. But once you tease it out, now you have to, to be creative and think about, all right, how can we solve this ideation? Uh, and that can be sketching and models and interviews and, and trying out stuff and all sorts of things to sort of get ideas um, uh, for these solutions. Number three, there you go. Number three is test and evaluate the outcome. So I, once I have my ideas, I got to test them. I need to make sure that they're going to work. So I always do that, go and uh, make a, a, a model or, or, or talk to somebody, or if it's a print work, uh, or suppose if we're talking about graphic design with UX, or if it's a website or something, you mock it up and then you go let people test it. Actually, in the digital world, a lot of times you can test it sort of for real. You can sort of put it up there and let people start using the website or the app or something and then get their real-time comments and sort of fix it on the fly, which is excellent. I mean, with products, it's hard to do that because you got to pay, you know, $20,000 to create a mold or something for a, for a glass or something like that. And nobody wants to shell out that money, but with graphic stuff, sometimes the, the money level is real low, so you can really sort of get it out there and just try it for real. Uh, the fourth one is refine and repeat. Um, until you have to stop. So you just go through the process again. Um, and it's important, I always say refine and repeat until you have to stop. Um, and that last phrase, until you have to stop, is a really important phrase and it breaks into two pieces. The until part is for your one and done people. People, and, and a lot of times these are not trained designers that are working in this, because most people that go to design school learn that you need to repeat and you need to continually go through this process. But for your one and done people that go in and say, Hey, here it is, bing, bang, boom, I made a solution. This is my first one, it's done, let's get it out there. Well, rarely does that ever work on the, on the first time. And so I, I tell people, until you need to continue to do it. And then the last part of that sentence, until you have to stop, that's for the perfectionists. Those are the people that do it over and over and over and over and over and it's never, it's never good. But at some point, you got to stop. At some point, you got to put it out there. At some point, your client's going to be like, hey, I, I, I need this website, or I need this app, or I need this product, and I can't keep paying you forever. Find a place to stop so that we can get it out there and get it working. And so that's it. Just those four things is what I always tell people. Identify the problem, ideate the solutions, test them, and then refine and keep doing it until you, until you have to stop. That's pretty much my process. So Matt, would you say, I know that dealing with clients can be a real pain in the, you know, patootie sometimes, but do you, can, do you enjoy working with clients or do you enjoy more working for yourself now? Well, I like working with people. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different people. It depends. Some people are really a pain in the butt and they're, they, they demand a lot and they don't, they don't understand Usually the clients, the best clients are the people that have done that, that have been clients before in whatever it is that you're asking, because they understand the time frames, they understand the budgets, they understand um, what's going on, all that kind of stuff. And so they they know, they know how things go, but it's sometimes it's people who are new or it's their first time working in it, that they have unrealistic uh, expectations. Uh, in the interior design world, HGTV is always sort of the bane of everybody's existence because it paints this picture of interior design that is um, not very realistic. Budget-wise, time-wise, uh, staff-wise, the amount of people you need to work with you, there seems to be on those shows all this free stuff that sneaks in, you know, and then everybody thinks they can, they can do a house on, you know, uh, $5,000, an entire house full of furniture and stuff, and it's like, yeah, we, we can't doesn't work that way. Um, so I enjoy working with people. It's just some people, some people work with you better than other people. That's the best way to say it. I, guess. I think we all have that challenge in some sense. Um, so another challenge is budgets and uh, particularly client budgets. And we face that all the time. We're always looking for that unicorn client that will let us have the special finishes and the beautiful paper and, you know, and they're willing to pay for it. But I imagine it's the same for you. You have all these ideas, but then you have maybe an unrealistic budget from your clients. So how do you deal with that? Dealing with budgets comes with experience. That's really the only thing, the only way that you can frame it. 
is people who are young or new to to any sort of design field or business field for that matter dealing with budgets is difficult it's just so much unknowns and being able to work through them only comes with experience and time or having a really good mentor your boss or a senior designer that you're working with and you stick real close to them and pay pay attention and you can learn or, or, or absorb what they already know much faster. So let me tell you this story. This is a, this is a person, this is a real story, personal story. I had just graduated. I had been out of Pratt for, I don't know, a few months and I got this client and it's this guy named Marius in Brooklyn. He was wanted to bake these cookies and he baked these awesome cookies and he wanted to sell them in um, high end, stores like Bergdorf Goodman and places like that. And literally he was going to, he was selling, he was actually already selling them a little bit. And they were like $12 a dozen, these cookies. And they were chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> now I, I wouldn't be paying 12 bucks a, a dozen, but they were good cookies. They were really good cookies. But he wanted uh, um, some packaging design for it. So he hired me right out of school to come do this package design for these cookies. And I worked my butt off. I did a really good job. I designed this plastic, uh, like architectural looking package that would hold the dozen, but it could also be broken down into individual things. The whole thing I engineered, it could be made, it's, it was one part that just sort of the, the base and the lid was the same part and then they would stack and they would do all this stuff. It was, it was beautiful and he loved it. The problem was, he only had $35,000 that he had taken out as a loan to like do his whole company. And I was sucking up money. And then I was suggesting to him that we cut a mold for this that was going to cost like $5,000, you know, and this was normally the molds were way more than that, but I had figured out a way to piggyback on somebody else's mold and cut costs and do aluminum, blah, 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 blah. Well, in the end, we ended up having to just part ways and it didn't really work out very well for either one of us. Now, um, the whole time I was sincere with what I was doing. I was dedicated, meaning I worked hard. I was highly skilled, right? Um, but ultimately I was off because I wasn't thinking about my client and what his real and his budgetary needs were. What I should have designed was an awesome bag, uh, you know, some standard bag, and then we could have done maybe a different die cut on it and some cool graphics or something like that, and that would have been much more sensitive to his budget. Now, granted, he should have been thinking about this as well, so it works sort of both, but me as the designer, I did not have his budget and his needs in the forefront of my brain. I was thinking, I'm gonna design this cool package, and it was, it was an awesome package at a great price, but it wasn't his price. And it sort of ended up where we had to just sort of part ways uh, after that. And I, I like that story because it's an example of, I was skilled and sincere and I worked hard, but I was still pointed in the wrong direction. And only through experience that I have now, am I able to look back and clearly see, it's like, oh yeah, I was totally going in the wrong direction. Um, and if I had if I'd done it differently, it, things might've turned out better. So I hope that was an interesting story. <laughs> that was a great story. Yeah. We should tell that to like every young designer ever. <laughs> um, so just currently with client work and everything else, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you face kind of on a daily basis? Um, well, I only do right now. I do client work a little bit here and there. Um, we have been fortunate with our interior design business that um, our work speaks for ourselves and it, it, we get a lot of word of mouth stuff. So we're able to get clients pretty well. My design work, uh, my product design work that I do on the side is a little more iffy, especially because coronavirus killed off. I, had, I have a client in Hong Kong that I was using, or that they were using me to design stuff. And when coronavirus hit, all of a sudden all that dried up and it was like, oh man, so I had to wait a while, but now we're starting to get back into it a, a little bit. So the biggest challenge for me is sort of balancing between the interior design business and doing this side stuff. And, and I, have, I have kids, we have two boys and um, we have to wrestle all that and 
you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, all the other stuff about design work and business and stuff, I've just been doing this for enough time, for, for enough years that it's, you know, it's just part of, part of what you do. But um, thankfully, we're, we're able to get, um, we're able to get clients uh, that come in pretty well. Um, I did do a, talking about uh, budgets and stuff, I did have a job that I did recently for this, this Hong Kong group that I was working for, where they, there was this product that is big in retail and they wanted to translate it to a promotional version. Well, the retail version sells for 50 bucks, um, and which is just not bad, but they needed a sell price of like $12 for the same thing. And so I had to figure out how to value engineer and reconfigure this quite complicated thing to be able to sell it for 12 bucks. And it was, it was huge. This project trying to figure it out, I figured it out, but my client sort of continues to move in a different direction. So it's actually, we're still working on it and they have sort of morphed it into something that is not even really the original product anymore. Much to my chagrin, I keep yelling at them about it. But, um, but I was the, the, the idea that someone could walk in and say, Hey, can you, uh, value engineer this to be able to be sold for one fifth the price of what it's normally sold for? I mean, it just seemed impossible at first, but you know, eventually we were able to cut this and do this and make this a little smaller and do all these different things. And, uh, we kind of got it close. I think I got it down to about $18 or something like that. But, um, that's always a pain, but it's fun. That's what we're in this job for is to do these. If someone just gives me an easy problem, what's the point of that? That's no fun. And I don't get to brag about it, like on a webinar to say, Hey, look what I saw. So. How is it? This is not on our list of questions we were going to ask, but I'm curious how it is. How is it working with clients in China? What are the challenges of working with people in a different country that how many hours difference? There are 13 ahead of central time so um china china's fun um i've gotten pretty used to it i've gotten to go there several times and i've been all over to factories everywhere so i'm pretty used to to working with them they um uh number one they their approach to design is a bit different um on the west we're constantly working on trying to push design in new directions, meaning the, the, the thoughts and the ideas um, in new directions. China is trying to catch up and, and, and catch the trends. I would say the West is trying to set trends all the time. They're always trying to move away what was. They don't like yesterday in the West. We always like tomorrow. And China is always moving into today they're trying to recognize a trend that's already happening and jump on it and and then you get this sort of tidal wave of products and ideas and solicitations of things that are following a trend that's happening right now uh, now there a design in china and chinese designers are actually getting much more robust and um there's a lot more innovation that is happening in china now um, and and that, a lot of that has to do with American or Western universities setting up universities, partnerships in China and training their students in the way that uh, European and American universities have trained design students. And so you're getting a lot of, a lot of young kids that are graduating and, and thinking like Western designers are. And that's good. I'm cool with that. Um, but traditionally, like your factory owners and stuff, they just want to find something, pinpoint it, jump on it, and ride it as far as they can. Um, the idea of intellectual property in China is a bit mysterious. Um, a lot of uh, the way that they understand intellectual property is different than the West. Um, and I wouldn't say it's nefarious. like. Now, there are plenty of, of people uh, that work in China, just like in the, in the United States, that are going to try and uh, um, uh, swindle you. Just everybody everywhere, is all, there's always people that try to swindle you. But the Chinese way of thinking about intellectual property is just, it's just different. It, they have not had that concept um, built into their culture in the same way that it has been in the West. Uh, and sometimes it's just a disconnect about 
it's like it's here well i'm just gonna make it you know we're, we're like well but no the law says it actually belongs to me and they're like well but i can i can make this i can make it you know and, and so sometimes a lot of the conversations have that disconnect and how to to deal uh with that and i've worked with a lot of of, of chinese suppliers that are really great people and many are straightforward and they do great great business but there is a disconnect sometime with explaining the difference between um uh, what is something that's patented or not patented or copyrighted or whatever and i've had i've had stuff ripped off lots of times um as well and it, it's just a bit different um the however working with china the time difference is good because you can submit stuff at the end of the day to your chinese partners um, and then they can work on it basically all night for you. And when you get up in the morning and come back to work, you can have some sort of something that's happened, um, some change. And then you work on yours during the day while they're asleep and then give them an update. And so sometimes it's like this tag team thing that can happen. And that can be very, very useful as far as expediency. Somebody in the chat pot asked if there's a language barrier. Um, uh, occasionally, uh, most uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, business people, any any business or factory is going to have a marketing or representative that speaks English to some degree. Um, some are better than others. So if you can learn Chinese, if you speak Chinese, you definitely have um, uh, an advantage and that certainly would be something to exploit. Um, but most of the time, the people that are working with the West uh, particularly Americans, and, and c because English is sort of the, the language of commerce, most everybody has somebody that speaks language. So every time I've gone over there, I've had somebody that speaks English, and then when I either deal directly with them or I deal through them to the factory owner or the business owner or something like that, and we just sort of make do. So... What would you like? What types of advice would you give to other designers wanting to break into the product and human centered design field? Um, let's see. I would say human centered design is really should be all design. A anything that you're doing, you need to be designing it for the people. Again, remember, human centered design is sort of an academic discipline that you can look and there's all this philosophy and very and unless you're really into it, you know, there's no point in getting down into the nitty gritty of all that stuff. But in general, again, it's keeping it in the forefront. It's keeping your customer and client um, in, in, in your mind as you design. They are a priority. And if you want to be focusing on that, it is a good way to differentiate what you do, to communicate to your clients, a great reassurer to your clients. If you have it on your on your website or you have it in your language when you're talking to clients to say we do human-centered design because we think the client is important to make sure that that whatever we're designing for you is going to work in the way that you need it to work and that's a great way to reassure your your client you don't want to walk in and sort of be all highfalutin with the uh, the idea of you know the, the high class designer who's like you will take what I design and that's what the way it will be you know um nobody wants to pay for that kind of an attitude they want to feel like you're really working for them and you've you've got them um in the in the front of your mind now here's another little story i want to tell about the idea of thinking about your client now this is not specifically it's kind of design it's more about customer service but you'll get the point so airbnb and some of you may have heard this before um Airbnb was founded actually by uh, two, I think, industrial design students. They started it during, there was an industrial design conference that was happening in California, and they came up with an idea to try and rent uh, apartment beds uh, in, in, in people's apartments for the students that were coming to this, so and they could make some money off of it. The B, it was the Airbnb was air bed and, and breakfast was what the idea, that and, and they had a bunch of air beds. That's where it came from. So anyway, they were, the guy that found it was being interviewed and he he talked about this customer service exercise and i'm going to sort of read it a little bit to make sure that i'm giving you the full the full thing um 
they went through this exercise about what a five star experience would be because when you use Airbnb, you have to rate everything at the end and you rate it one, two, three, four, five stars. And they, they wanted to go through this exercise about what do these stars mean and how can they uh, uh, improve upon their business based on it. So they, they did this exercise. They said, what would a one, two, or three star experience mean for an Airbnb person? And he says, um, so a one, two, or three star is that you get to your Airbnb and nobody's there, right? You knock on the door, they don't open. Um, uh, maybe they wait, make you wait for 20 minutes. If they never show up and you're ticked and you need to get your money back, that's a one-star experience, right? That's what people are going to do, right? So what's a, what's a five-star experience for Airbnb? A five-star experience is if you knock on the door, they open the door, they let you in, great, not a big deal. Um, you're not going to tell every friend about this, um, but you, you, you'd be like, hey, I used Airbnb, I'd use them again. That's, that's like a five-star experience. So they said, well, how can we push this further? They don't have a ranking that's five, beyond five stars. They said, how can we further? So they said, what's a six star experience just for fun? A six star experience is you knock on the door, the host opens and says, hey, I'm, I'm Matt, welcome to my house. Um, and uh, on the table, there's a welcome gift and there's a bottle of wine, maybe there's some candy. You open the fridge, there's water, and you say, hey, here's some food. In the bathroom, there's toiletries. It's a whole great experience. That's a six star experience. So what would a, what would a seven star experience be like? That's where you knock on the door. You say, welcome, here's my full kitchen. You can use everything that's in it. Hey, I know you like surfing. I did a little, I looked on your Facebook profile. I know you like surfing. I got a surfboard here ready for you to, to go. Um, and uh, oh, by the way, uh, here's my car. You can use my car the whole time you're here. And I booked some uh, uh, reservations at the best restaurant in town. And I know it's the kind of food you like. That kind of thing. That's a seven star experience. What would a, what would a 10-star experience look like, right? Uh, a 10-star experience would be the Beatles check-in, which is like your plane arrives and you get off the plane and there's like thousands of screaming young people going, yay, you're the best, we're so glad you're here, right? Um, and uh, you get off the plane, there's uh, cars welcoming you, They, uh, you go to your front yard and everybody's, they take you directly to the, the best a restaurant in town you do all this kind of crazy stuff that would be like a, a 10 star what would an 11 star experience 11 star experience is elon musk shows up and takes you to space you know like that's craziness now here's here's the thing so maybe this 9 10 11 star experience that they came up with is not feasible that is not something that you can do with airbnb or something you could do on a design project right but after doing that exercise and going that far knowing somebody's preferences and having a surfboard waiting for them and maybe a reservation at a restaurant doesn't seem too out of out of step for what you could do and it's a way to push the boundaries of what you can offer and the idea was they were really customer focused they were thinking ahead of time about what their customers needed and how could they push that boundary when i was at pratt one of my professors used to always say when you're designing a product and you're presenting to a client um, if your client wants you, if you're here and your client wants you to go here, you need to present here because your client's always going to reel you back. And if you ever want to make progress, if you go right to where your client thought it was, they're going to reel you back and you're going to end up with a design that's back here. But if you go here, they'll reel you back, but you might still end up ahead of what everybody thought. And then you end up with something new and innovative. And that's exactly what these Airbnb people uh, were doing. And that's a great way to look at at um at customer service and design and working with these clients so anyway i always thought that was a great story that airbnb thing i, I mean i wish i wish i'd have thought of it but i love it <laughs> we've got about 10 minutes left so we're going to start transitioning into some of our questions from our viewers um paige do you want to start with one yeah so lauren asks what would be your dream item or client to work on or design Oh, my dream client. Um, let's see. I, mean, I guess in the product design world, uh, I would love to, you know, when I was a graduate student, I, I always liked cars a lot growing up. And when I was a graduate student, I had an internship at General Motors. That was, so I took that. I, never, I knew that I wasn't going to work as a, as a car designer. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't not take that internship. So when they offered it, so I said, all right, I'm going to do it because I got to move to Detroit and I got to work in there. 
I would love for one of the car companies to come back to me and say, all right, now that you're, you know, mature as a designer or whatever, we, we want you to, uh, we, to do a whole concept car now and we'll like do it full on, you know, and you'll get a whole team of people or something like that um, to, to do that. Would, that would really be fun to do. Somehow cars are just like this trophy thing that would be really great to, to be able to do. That's awesome. In reality. And not just as an intern, you know. Um, that's really cool. Uh, we've had several people ask, uh, Rachel and Sarah, I believe, um, where do you draw inspiration from and what are your top resources for inspiration and research? Okay. Inspiration is like what I was talking about earlier about being prepared ahead of time, which is having a broad sense of what's around you. So reading news, reading magazines, reading books, um, listening to podcasts, uh, going to stores. I love when I'm driving down the street, in, even in a town where, where I live, I'll see a store that I've never seen before. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And it'll register my mind. And then later on when I'm driving down uh, and I have an extra five minutes, I'll pull over to say, okay, what's going on in this store? You know, there's like a vintage uh, furniture store here in Fairhope called La La Land that opened up. And I was going to Win Dixie and I was like, oh, what the heck's in there? Let me see that. So, and they got all this cool old stuff. And it's great because it's, it's inputting stuff. So I'm constantly looking. Now, one thing that I would suggest you do is do not read um, industry publications that fit with your industry. I mean, read them a little bit, but, but make sure you read other things. If you're a graphic designer, read about furniture design. If, if you're a furniture designer, read about um, uh, architecture or toy design or something like that. Because what happens is if you're constantly just reading the magazines or the blog posts uh, of, of your area, and that's all you read, you, you sort of get this narrow view. And a lot of the best inspiration comes from if I was a car designer and I see something happening in the furniture world and I'm like, oh man, we could apply that to the seats in here or to the exterior or whatever. And it's totally crazy and not, not, a, a, not related or doesn't seem related at first. But then remember as designers, our whole job is to take things that don't seem related and stitch them together into something that works and solves a problem. So. That's what, oh, and some resources. You asked about some resources. So um, the, if you go to IDEO.org, I-D-E-O.org, it's their, uh, the branch of IDEO, which is a big uh, design firm. It's their sort of um, public service branch. They have a book called the, the Field Guide to Human-Centered Design. You can get it for free. You can buy a hardback or you can download the PDF, and it basically goes through how to do human-centered design and everything. Uh, you should you should read that if you're on about sketching particularly product sketching there's a book by a, an author a Swedish author named Koos Eisen K-O-O-S-E-I-S-E-N it's just called sketching so just look up Koos I don't know too many people named Koos so that's he'll probably be the only one um, podcasts the best podcasts to listen to are business podcasts entrepreneurial because as the designer we need to understand the entrepreneur because most of our clients are going to be business people and entrepreneurs who need to understand their mindset, but it also helps us to be entrepreneurial. So Masters of Scale, Reed Hoffman. That's the guy that, that I told you does the tours of duty. Um, How I Built This is a great podcast. Business Wars is a great podcast. It goes through like the wars between like Coke and Pepsi and, and how they, and there's a lot of marketing stuff and you get to hear about how they, how they fought each other. Uh, 20,000 Hertz is one about sound editing, which is really awesome. Um, and then I'll just plug, there's this one guy that I love. He's, I think he's Swedish. His name is Love Hulten, L-O-V-E-H-U-L-T-E-N. He has an Instagram and he has a website um, and he makes, I won't even explain it. Any of you that are interested, it's like electronics and retro and it's really cool but he hand makes all this stuff and it's a great aesthetic go check his stuff out love holton h-u-l-t-e-n he's like my favorite guy so there there's some there's some uh resources that's really interesting and what we'll do is try to get a list from you matt after this so we can put it up on the youtube um 
video that we have saved and also the podcast version, which if you guys don't know, we have this up on Apple Podcasts and several other sites as a podcast now. Um, let's see. We did have one question from Sarah asking us, do you do all your rendering in Photoshop or use other programs as well? Oh, uh, I don't do Photoshop rendering all that much anymore because it's very labor intensive. So like those, those TVs or that microwave or some of those other ones that I had in there, it takes a while to get the photorealistic thing um, or a view. I do, if I'm doing fast sketches, what I'll usually do is I'll sketch it for real, uh, either with a pencil or on my computer. I have like a tablet and then in Photoshop, I'll fill it in with color and shading and stuff. And it's much quicker than the photorealistic thing. But for photorealistic stuff now, I just use CAD and, and rendering and I'll build it because if I'm going to do a 3D print of it, or they're going to have, or the engineers are going to have to to get the I the thing and and figure out how to do the tooling for it, I might as well go ahead and communicate it in the CAD file. And then to render it now is is real easy compared to when I was in school. It was a pain, but now it's like super easy. And shoot, even Photoshop's got rendering stuff uh, in Photoshop. And then Adobe, if you haven't looked, they have, and I can't remember the name of the program. They have a separate program if you have the adobe suite that you uh the creative cloud it's free and it's meant specifically for rendering it's dimension it's, maybe, it's dimension dimension yeah that's it yeah. and it's it's meant specifically for rendering stuff and you can either do like packaging or if you went to like thingiverse or any of these online 3d libraries you could download those and stick it in your rendering and you could do whole environments and all, all sorts of stuff You're on mute. Sorry. You're on mute. Uh, we have like one minute left. So I'm just going to kind of wrap up everything because um, I know everybody has to get back to work from lunch. Uh, but we have enjoyed having you all here with us today uh, for our Design Bites episode. If you guys have any suggestions um, for future topics, we would love to hear that. Uh, you can post on our Facebook page or Instagram at AIGA Mobile or feel free to email us. Uh, my email is mcary, C-A-R-Y, at mobile.aiga.org. Um, Matt, do, would you be willing to share your um, contact information? Should anybody have any questions for resources? Yeah, I'll put it, I'll put it in, the, uh, in the links with the, with the resources. Awesome. That sounds great. Um, and thank you so much, Matt, for coming. We really appreciate having you. It's always great to talk to you um, because you have great stories. <laughs> yeah.